and now uh, love, sex, and the consequences. Uh, <laughs> that's why we know you're all here. <laughs> and giving us that talk tonight uh, is, and I have not heard her give this talk before, but any talk I've heard, she does a, a phenomenal job for us. She's an extraordinary speaker. She's a co-CEO of the uh, American Civil War Museum. Uh, she has been down at Tredegar and has also been uh, directors at several other museums throughout the country and down at uh, Colonial Williamsburg. Vast experience in a lot of time periods. So uh, <laughs> please welcome with us this evening, Christy Coleman. Good evening, everyone. Isn't Linda terrific? She's just, I don't know how she does it. OK, so. <laughs> I will just tell you right off the bat, there are no pictures. There will be no pictures, there will be no slides. Um, but hopefully some of the descriptions and things that I will share with you, you will allow your own imagination to expand things for you. Um, as the description said, tonight's program, Love, Sex, and Consequences, is an intimate look at the American Civil War. Um, because really, we have this um, romanticism, if you will, about war, right? We have these uh, images in our mind of the, the, the soldier marching off with his forlorn lover trailing behind him and the kisses and the hugs when they come back. And yes, all of that happens, but there's a lot of other things that happen in the course of war, some of them uh, not nearly as pleasant, um, some of them can be actually downright criminal. And it also is a transformation of communities when this happens. So essentially, I'm going to tell you how I'm breaking this down for you. To keep it simple, get your mind thinking about it. We're going to talk a little bit about just what were the sexual mores at the time. Now, as I was sharing with these ladies before we began, the pendulum around sexuality through time actually swings pretty far at different points in time to where we become really puritanical, very restrictive to a much looser concept of human sexuality and, and how people are able to express themselves. And what's interesting about this is that um, as America was continuing to grow and change, it too was swinging in the pendulum depending on one's social class because that really determined how you viewed this topic. So, 1840s, 1850s, there's some interesting things happening on the European scene, for example. Um, we are in a period where the pendulum is starting to swing a little bit more to, actually let me swing this way, swinging a little bit more towards uh, increasing conservatism around sexuality. Um, and <clears throat> because of that, you know, there is a, among the, particularly among the wealthier classes, the onus of maintaining sexual purity was actually on women. Not in fact necessarily for women to be uh, chaste, per se, but for women not only to control her sexuality, but that of her husband's or the man in her life. It was her responsibility to keep him from being overly sexed. Otherwise, he would somehow become um, less effective as a provider, less effective in his community business if he were oversexed. So it was her job to refrain from that. And so, <laughs> really fascinating. And, and what you find is that some of these ideas begin to trickle into the middling sort working class, but not necessarily poor. They begin to kind of watch, they're watching this because, you know, there is a tendency to what are, what are the uppers doing? You're trying to emulate. So that some of this is spilling over, but the reality is <laughs> it's not always happening. Um, there are less taboos necessarily around sexuality among lower classes, and, and unfortunately that takes on a stereotypical notion, and it really shouldn't. It's simply a matter of um, because there are not often the same um, concerns around property and transfer of property among heirs and things of that sort and that there is a different notion of that. And more often than not, lower class peoples tend to have um, closer ties to ethnic backgrounds 
then do middling and upper sorts. So we see, again, this, this interesting dynamic depending on one's social class and station uh, uh, at the time. So again, tonight, we're going to start off with what you may be more familiar with, the tender love stories. How did soldiers and sailors and loved ones deal with all of this in the grand scheme of things? And I, I, I love going through letters. You probably have some even within your own families as folks were exchanging their thoughts to one another in the course of war. One relates to that I'm going to share with you. It's written in November of 1862. It's from Stephen Tippett Andrews to his lovely Maggie Little. And this was actually a secret affair, um, or at least they hoped that it would be a secret affair. He, he fell in love with this young woman. She was about 16, 17 at the time, and her parents really didn't want her at that point, particularly to this young man. Um, but nonetheless, they, they exchanged a number of letters. And she actually ends up writing to him and says, um, my sister in one of her letters not long ago spoke, I'm sorry, he, he gets a letter. It says, my sister in one of her letters not long ago spoke of that little love affair of mine. How she found out our secret I do not know, nor do I care. I had just as leave the whole world, I would just as much leave that the whole world would know that I love so good a girl as Maggie, right? Then we have another interesting one. This one is from September of 1862 as well. And this young gentleman writes, God bless you dearest for your kind and encouraging letter. It came like a sunbeam to brighten my pathway. While reading it, I forgot my wounds and in thought, I was again with my little curly head pet again. Do you know, darling, that thoughts of happy hours spent with you are the kindest ones that come to cheer me in my hour of loneliness? What weird enchantment is this with which you surround me that scarce do my thoughts wander to my loved ere they wander to my little tease? But I suppose that is one of your mischievous pranks so I'll just grin and bear it. Now, there are other young men who don't have particularly a love at home or someone waiting for them. And some of these young men would turn actually to the papers because a number of papers, just actually kind of similar to the way we do today where, you know, we, we say send letters to soldiers overseas or send care packages or things like that. So several newspapers, this one comes out of the special collections um, at Virginia Tech actually. And this one is a, a young man who is um, <clears throat> writing back to a friend, a family friend uh, named Eddie. And he, he's just lonely. He's just, he just needs somebody. And he writes to her, I get lonesome sometimes and I do not know what to do. If I ever get out of the service alive, I am going to settle down and get married. What a novel idea that is. Perhaps you will not believe it, but I'm not joking. I am not quite the old bachelor yet, but I fear I will be before long. If you know of some good looking, amiable young lady that wished to change her situation in life, just mention the fact to her and tell her there is a soldier in the army that wishes to marry in less than two years after his time expires in the army. I am very truly <laughs> yours. And then for the guys who went a little bit further with these newspaper accounts, right? Now this particular gentleman, he's answering a letter. He actually started a, a pen pal relationship with a young lady named Hattie. And he's from uh, uh, the 11th New York uh, Battery. This letter is written in February of 1864. I'm not going to read the whole letter because, actually, I probably should because the entire letter is really hilarious. This guy has an amazing sense of humor. He's, it, it's, you'll begin to see. Dear Hattie, pardon the affectionate familiarity, but you know it's all in fun. 
Your charming little epistle has just reached me, and I do myself the honor to answer it immediately, thus complying with your request to write soon. Before, <laughs> before proceeding farther, truth and candor compel me to acknowledge that a little deception was used in the advertisement in the Waverly. In other words, my true description differs materially <laughs> from the one therein set forth and may not please you as much as the one fancy painted. But I thought it was all for fun. Therefore, funnily gave a fictitious description as well as a cognomen. Be it known unto you then, this individual is 29 years old, 5 feet and 11 inches high, dark blue eyes, brown hair, and light ruddy complexion. There you have it. How do you like the description? And then he goes on to say, it is said that a person's writing is an indication of their character. If so, judging from your letter, I take you to be uh, of one, I'm sorry, I take you to be of one that class knows as romps. A class, by the way, which I rather admire. Commend to me a girl who has life and animation enough to enjoy the harmless pleasures of this beautiful world. In preference to your Miss Prim, who would not dare laugh in louder tones. No, indeed. None of your Miss Prim for me. I love the gaily ringing laugh of a true and gladsome heart. Of course, I would not have a young lady act in an imbecilic or unbecoming or unladylike manner. But I believe in giving free scope to thou joyous feelings implanted in the soul by a wise and kind creator to cheer us through life's checkered pathway. <laughs> so he then, in this particular one, he ends up actually sending her an image of himself. And they do continue to write. I have no idea whether he actually ended up marrying Hattie or not, or if he ever actually met her. But the mere fact that this guy, I have my own picture of him, is just a, just a fun-loving guy who, again, this idea of the pendulum kind of swings a little bit, right? So th there you have it. Now, other soldiers who may not have had a love at home or a girl that he's writing, or a forlorn heart, or more restraint, or just had natural inclinations because they are young men, right? Found their pleasures <clears throat> elsewhere. Uh, whether it was with young ladies that they came through as the armies were moving through, young women made themselves available. Some of them were young women who were left behind as fathers and brothers and soldiers went away. And this is something that we often don't talk about. It's easy to talk about camp followers and things like that. But in the communities that these armies moved through, many women did not have any other course of income. And prostitution becomes their course of income. So that raises a really interesting question about birth control, doesn't it? How did they protect themselves? Any ideas? None? <laughs> Not a one? Well, hmm. <laughs> there are six major techniques known during the time of the war to prevent unwanted pregnancy. They hadn't gotten to the point where they could prevent uh, disease, but they could, to a certain degree, control pregnancy. And there were six ways that they did that. Of course, there was coitus interruptus, right? No, everybody knows what I mean, yeah? If you don't, don't be ashamed. Just raise your hand and I'll say, or just do one of those and I'll, I'll see you over the corner and I'll be happy to explain it as delicately as I can. Coitus reservatus. You know that one? Oh, see, I see the faces. Okay, okay. So this one requires a considerable amount of control on the gentleman's part. Almost a zen-like ability <laughs> <laughs> to, 
to not even get as far as the coitus interruptus. <laughs> Essentially, this is get happy, back off a little bit, wait a little bit, go back in. <laughs> that was called coitus reservatus. Condoms have been around for centuries. But here's the beauty. You know Charles Goodyear? <laughs> well, vulcanized rubber, because condoms prior to that are mostly animal skins. Okay, or there's some kind of cloth, usually silk encased things, and you'd have a little box that you would carry them around in, and when you used it, then you'd wash it, and you'd put it back in the box. I know, that's what I told you, you didn't want pictures. <laughs> um, but Charles Goodyear, 1839, 1843, vulcanized rubber. We can do all kinds of things with this now. And they did. Still coming in a little box, still have only one. And you wash it when you're done. And you stick it back in the box. <coughs> <coughs> Douches, the least effective of them, even known as least effective at the time. But the idea was if you could uh, use a vinegar mixture, usually an apple vinegar mixture of some type, and do it immediately following. They thought that that would make the environment so acidic that it would not go any further. <clears throat> and then there were sponges, vaginal sponges, often called womb shields. Um, and these uh, <laughs> are exactly what they say they are. They were essentially a cervical block and so women would insert um, sponges and, and this would absorb and block and it proved to be a, yeah, the, all of this is going on in, I mean, all of this is going on. This is not new technology at the time. And last, <clears throat> but probably most uncomfortably for some, was abortion. Um, and there were three primary ways that abortion was, was uh, done at the time. Um, it was either herbal, mechanical, or surgical. Most frequently, it was herbal and mechanical. But, and by herbal, they, they snake root, ergo, um, cotton root, was particularly big in the South, was the one that was used most in the South. Um, and mechanical, they had actually pumps, which I, can't even imagine, but they had pumps that, uh, vacuum pumps, and, and the idea there is opening the cervix um, uh, at that time. And then the surgical was actually, uh, there was a product that was very popular called Chamberlain's Uterovaginal Syringe. And this particular device did the same thing, basically cervical dilation, um, and it was a home product. Now, if you think that these things are not common, they were quite common in terms of women and men controlling the rate of birth. Some statistics for you, and this is based on, because the doctors, and here's the other thing, doctors at the time are, you know, they kind of brag with each other about the effectiveness of various treatments and things that they're doing. So there's a lot of literature on this. In 1840, one out of 30 live births, um, uh, let me correct, out of 30 births, uh, at least one of those would have been an abortion. By 1870, you're looking at one out of five pregnancies being aborted by 1870. And this is across all classes, okay? So th this, is a, this is a method of birth control at the time that was you know, accepted. Yes, there are absolutely religious groups at the time who were, who were horrified by this reality, but these were things that could be purchased in the mail, that were advertised freely in newspapers. Um, they often um, used interesting language to describe what they were, but you would also see the word abortif uh, abortificent, uh, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, just advertised that you could order these things and, and they would be sent to you. Um, so here's the thing. I mean, something is happening and it's not abstinence. Because 
The average woman in 1800 has seven children. Hmm. By 1870, the number is down to four. <coughs> By 1900, it's three and a half. And we know today, it's roughly 2.2 to 2.5, because women were controlling their birth rates, their family planning. Moving on. So let's go back to the oldest profession, shall we? Because there's some really interesting stories there. Um, the most fascinating to me is <laughs> There's a story about um, a group of prostitutes in Nashville. Now, in, now, here's something that, especially for the Confederate soldiers coming into major cities, many of these young men had never seen some of the things that they're seeing when they come into these cities. Um, and yes, every community had houses of ill repute. Every city, Richmond, oh my lord. Um, all you have to do is look at the newspapers at the time. Somebody's getting arrested for some rowdy behavior or for soliciting or y you name it. Because at the time, interestingly, they are charging men and women, uh, which is kind of nice. But, um, but nonetheless, there was a group of prostitutes in Nashville, a lot of them, registered. They know who they are. The registered words, anyway, were about, you know, about 350, but there were about 100 of them who were, were described as being their most infamous sex workers. And so <laughs> when um, George Spaulding, who was the provost marshal in Nashville in 1863, had an idea. He wanted to clean the city up. So what he does <laughs> is that he um, has, uh, gets in touch with and actually seizes a boat owned by a man by, by the name of Rosencrantz, his, his newly christened steamboat, the Idaho. Isn't that kind of interesting, the name? Idaho. Um, newly christened Idaho on maiden voyage, and the general says, the provost marshal says, look, get these women out of here, take them up river to Cincinnati or someplace. And you know, Rosencrantz says, I don't want to do that. It's a brand new ship. It's going to have bad reputation. I'm going to have these women on here, the furniture and the beds. I don't want to do that. It's like, look, we'll pay you $5,000 to get these women out of Nashville. There's just too much going on. There's too much disease, and we know it's these women. Get them out of here. So he loads the women up, and up they go up the Mississippi. And nobody will let them dock the boat. And this adventure goes on for over a year. They're struggling to get supplies on there to feed the women. They start getting sicker. There's no medical care. It's just a mess. It's a mess. So they bring them all back to Nashville, eventually. So they decide another approach that's not only used in Nashville, but it was uh, used in, in uh, um, uh, Memphis in particular. To some, some say that they think a similar system was used in Richmond, but most of those records, as you know, were destroyed. And the system was, okay, rather than beating them, why don't we just join them? Let's have doctors inspect the women, and we will license the women who are the clean women, and they'll come in once a month to be inspected by the doctors to make sure that they're not carrying venereal disease, and they'll pay a $5 license fee for legal prostitution. Did you know that? Some of y'all are not and you knew that. Yeah, yeah, right? So they get the little pass and they can wave the little pass on the street corner and they can make lots of money because these are the safe women. But here's the beauty of it. They, they found almost immediately that the incidences of soldiers being down from venereal disease dropped dramatically by this system. So other cities began to adapt it, maybe not as formally as they had done, particularly in Memphis, but they began to adopt a similar practice. And so we begin to see the incidences of venereal disease go way down.
because before they started doing a lot of this, um, the numbers are, are, are truly staggering. Um, truly staggering in terms of the numbers of men who are contracting disease. Um, at one point, for the Union Army, where the records are more intact, at one point, it was estimated that up to 20% of young men had contracted the disease at one time or another. That's an extraordinarily high time. If you are fortunate, if you are fortunate, you get gonorrhea. If you're not, you get syphilis. The problem with syphilis was it masks itself depending on, because its incubation period can be very long. It starts off as something that's relatively small and almost ignored, in that an ulcer might appear, it's gone within a couple of weeks, you're good. You may not have another symptom literally for years before the virus begins to expand and, ex and start causing all kinds of havoc. The treatment for these things, gentlemen, were horrid, were absolutely horrid. Most involved insertions into the urethra and the penis um, with mercury and all kinds of things designed to, to, to um, wipe out the disease. And more often than not, you're wiping out the man. So needless to say, it was just, a, it was just horrible. And so um, the desire, again, to, to maintain the cleanliness of the prostitutes um, took on uh, quite a bit of, of importance. Um, there is a, let's see, I'm going to give you a couple other statistics. I want to go back to Nashville for a minute. In, in 1864, it was estimated that there were 5,000, um, I'm sorry, 1864 was estimated there were 5,000 active prostitutes in Washington. Oh, well, Washington, D.C., that is, I'm sorry. Um, in Nashville, in 1860, there was an area called Smoky Row, which is where these women more often were not. And at the time, it, uh, there were 198 sex workers. By 62, the number had reached 1,500. By 64, only 352 of these women were licensed. But they were making, they were earning <laughs> a lot of money. Um, these women were earning, some of them, imagine this for a minute, because it, it would be, well, prices varied. Um, but these women could make 25 to $30 a week or more. Not bad if you can manage it. And many of them didn't have any other choice. And that's another point that I, I really want to lay on. When you're talking about would you rather starve to death or would you rather find a way to support yourself and or potentially children and there are no other options for work for you. You can try laundering, but if you're getting paid, you know, 10 cents for a bundle of clothes or whatever the price point is, that is not going to feed your children. That is not going to feed you. That is not going to keep a roof over your head. And so for many of these women, that was their choice of work. They became sex workers. Towards the end of the war, New York City, they estimated that 2 to 5% of the female population was engaged in one way or another in the sex trade. Now, it may not seem like a lot, but think about, and this is a major American city, even in 1860, 1865, two to 5% of the women were involved in the sex trades. So this was very real. But we've already talked about what happens when one spends the night with Venus. They wake up in the morning with a lifetime of Mercury. But sometimes things are not always consensual. And that's what we're going to talk about next. In this section I refer to as without want or consent and sexual assault in the military. Again, Confederate records are destroyed on these points. Um, there, are, uh, uh, there are some exceptions. Um, in terms of newspaper accounts um, that are really difficult to determine the range or nature of the crime. 
uh, because of the descriptions that are used in the paper. But uh, if victims are identified as women, um, one can presume, since they are not talking about property crimes in particular, that this is happening. In the Union, again, there are far more records about this. And uh, some, a study that was done, um, I guess probably about 10, 10 years ago, looked at some of these cases, particularly, specifically, court-martial cases that involved rape or attempted rape. The ranks of the accused range from privates to lieutenants. It's interesting to note that no uh, officer above the rank of lieutenant was ever had charges brought against them. It is also important to note that there is considerable dif difference in what happens during these cases, uh, whether the soldiers are black men, white men, officers, or enlisted. It's <laughs> the other thing is only 58% of the cases, let me back this up, of the 100 cases of rape, 58 of them would be charged with another crime. So here's the thing, it was very rare, well, I shouldn't say rare, it's more common to be charged with rape or attempted rape if you are also being charged with larceny or some property crime. To simply be charged with rape or attempted rape um, is something that because of, again, the mores of the day, even how people rev rev think about that um, becomes really testing. Um, because we victim blame. And they certainly did it at the time. Um, a lot of the cases that I read, <laughs> you see that. You know, um, <coughs> of course we can't say what the woman was wearing because they're all virtually covered up, right? But it talks about behavior of these women. Loose-tongued, uh, she was drinking, she was in the presence of, of men without an escort, she was, you know, you have these very uh, patriarchal um, examples and things where they are, again, going after the victim of these crimes. Of those men charged, and again, this is the court-martial cases, 50% of black men charged with rape or attempted rape were executed. 25% were acquitted. Another 25% were assigned to hard labor. In cases involving white males, only 20% of them would ever be executed for the crime. And more often than not, as I said, it is often tied to property crime or something that was done so, considered so heinous to the woman beyond sexual assault that it warranted execution. 22% were acquitted, 68% given hard labor. And again, it should be noted that among white men, none above the rank of lieutenant were ever charged with nor could they ever face the threat of execution. However, among black soldiers, rank made no difference in terms of protections. Of the victims of the cases, this, these particular 335 cases of record, among the victims, 20 were identified as black women. Only one of those women saw her accuser convicted. That case was where a white soldier um, was convicted of raping an enslaved woman. And her name was Harriet Elizabeth McKinley. And it was the first time, uh, according to the scholar Sharon Block, it was the first time that a white man had been convicted of raping an enslaved woman in the survey of cases that she had done between 1700 
1865. Now, the thing about that I think is pretty clear. Not only because of prevailing thoughts about um, how one may choose to use one's property, or thoughts of superiority, or what have you, um, it was an extraordinary finding. Um, I, I have to uh, qualify that by saying I haven't yet found any other uh, collaboration of her findings. Um, but she has written extensively. She's a woman studies scholar. She's written extensively on war and women and, and things of that sort. Um, but it was a stunning, stunning case. Um, and in the case of why he was, is that not only did he rape and sodomize her, he beat her brutally and then um, cut her. Um, it was savagely cutting and stabbing and marking her body. And it was such a heinous thing that the community was absolutely outraged by what he had done to her. So, yeah, not pretty. Not pretty. But it also, again, reveals another really interesting thing. When we talk about women and their bodies, some bodies were more protected than others, is the bottom line. Um, so moving on from that, without will and consent. So what happens next? What did all of this mean? When the war is over and soldiers are going home and women are trying to return to some level of normalcy and what happens next? The pendulum swings. We move back into very conservative, puritanical ideas about sexuality. We move into the Victorian period. Right? So all of this somewhat freedom and exploring and controlling one's body goes completely away. It won't come back, swing back until the 1920s. It's like a 50 year cycle. And it always seems to be around war. Whenever there's war, we get a little loose. <laughs> it wouldn't be until World War II that extended conversations and actually the army doing even more to cut down on venereal disease. Because World War I, we know it was devastating because of sex sexual transmitted diseases were a big deal. So by World War II, not we are not just saying, boys, wrap it up. By World War II, there are all kinds of posters and banners and they're distributing condoms. They are doing all kinds of things to protect the soldier. Because if you think about it, if the army stats are even remotely similar to what was happening in the Confederacy, if you're losing one, of, one out of five of your soldiers because of sexual disease, that's a problem. That's a very real problem. And so it goes. But after the war, there's an interesting man in the US his name is Anthony Comstock. Are you all familiar with the Comstock Laws? Okay, this became, he was, who? talk about puritanical. He uh, really, really thought it was absolutely disgusting that soldiers were receiving um, French nudes, basically pornography. There were, and I, excuse me, it's pornographic. It's not just nudes. Some of these images of men and women doing what men and women do and some uh, are really, um, they are in the National Archive. I mean, you can, they're there. I mean, these cards that would be sent to the soldiers in the field, both sides of the army, you could order them through a catalog. You could order condoms through the catalog. All those, you know, all of those devices and things that I talked about could be ordered through the catalog. So Comstock says, look, we got to cut all that out. Stop using the United States Postal Service for obscenities. And believe it or not, he considered birth control to be an obscenity. And he actually was able to um, have all of this. Uh, he was he was a he was a kind of a tight dude. Um, 
you know, he, he fought against alcohol and gambling and tobacco and atheism among the troops and he, you know, he just, he had all this kind of stuff. And he, he, <laughs> he was deeply concerned that uh, the, the ease with which soldiers were able to get any obscene, this is quote, any obscene book, pamphlet, picture, print, an other publication of vulgar and indecent character through the mail. So he took it upon himself to rally members in Congress to get what became known as the Comstock Laws passed that prevented these items from being transmitted through the mail. And again, it began a cycle. Shops were actually raided and closed down for selling them, even though they weren't transmitting things through the mail anymore. You'd actually have to go into the pharmacies to get these things or go into the shop to get them. He was relentless. And, um, and the damage that he caused, some believe, actually caused a spike in some of these diseases again because of what Comstock done, the readily available um, protections were no longer there. So um, that's it, gentlemen and ladies. I'm trying to be sensitive to the time. Um, but there you have it. Love, Sex, and Consequences, an intimate look at the American Civil War. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them now. Yes? Soldier wasn't any any relation to her at all. Okay. Who brought the, the, the suit? Um, I believe it was uh, one of the relatives of the people who did own her. Were those statistics north or south? Most of the statistics, uh, the the national statistics about birth rates and things, those are national. The, 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 the things about the soldiers in particular, about, uh, up to 20% of the soldiers at one time contracting these, those are predominantly uh, from the Union Army. Speculation is that the Confederacy numbers may have been as high. It was more likely to happen if Confederate troops moved into urban areas. So if units or troops moved through, the, through a, an urban area, they were more likely to contract at the same rates. But that's extrapolation because, again, those records don't, they're just not as readily available to us. Um, yes, sir. Um, Anthony Comstock, what was his position? Um, <laughs> he was, he actually served as a chaplain for the Union Army. He was stationed in Florida. They basically wanted to get him out of the way. And he was stationed down, of course, he was such, he was really quite, I mean, he, he was, he made Jerry Falwell look conservative. I mean, he was really very conservative about all of these issues. But he was a chaplain. And, and it's from what he saw uh, as service as a chaplain that really pushed him over the edge to try to do that. So when the war is over, he goes back to New York. He's from New York. Um, he, he goes back to New York, and he starts this crusade. And he's back and forth in Washington, and that's he what he does. He didn't have official position in the government. No, he did not. He did not. He just had a lot of influence and power because of family name, money, etc. Yes. Um, there was one thing that I meant to share with you all, but I didn't get. This is one of those quirky little stories that you go, huh? Um, so I like to leave people with a little laughter. So this, well, it may, might make you laugh. I don't know. Um, so. There's a interesting gentleman by the name of the very Reverend James Cook Richmond. And he was a priest in the Protestant Episcopal Church and chaplain to the second Wisconsin Regiment of Infantry Volunteers. His career was very conventional, you know, he was educated at Harvard, he went to Europe for further study, he comes back. He's doing all these things, he becomes a missionary. But when the um, Civil War started and 2nd Wisconsin is sent off, he goes with them. And two years later, he ends up in Washington. And he is uh, in Washington principally working at the Treasury Department. 
And in the Treasury Department, he becomes completely infatuated with this young woman. Completely infatuated with this young woman to the point where he starts writing her letters. And, and the letters become more and more explicit and more and more disturbing. And she keeps them all. They're actually in the National Archives. Among the things, the softer things he says, he start, this is one of the softer letters from the beginning, he writes, of your bosoms and your lovely body, perfectly proportioned, great round mountains of delight, <laughs> rising out of the odiferous valley of Kashmir. <laughs> He talks about the prince of love and then goes on to say, even now, larger, stiff, and rising at the thought. <laughs> well, yeah, so the last letter that he sent her, he actually drew a picture of it. <laughs> and then put a ruler next to the picture to let her know what she'd be dealing with. <laughs> and then he draws a picture of her that he thinks she looks like. And what he'd like to do with the ruler. <laughs> with her mounds of cashmere. So at this point, She's no longer amused. <laughs> so this is the funny thing. I mean, you know, I guess the poor woman didn't, look, she probably didn't know what to do, but when a guy sends you, basically, he, he, he sends you, he, he what, what do you call it? What do the kids call it today? S sexting you, yeah. right? She, she, she doesn't know what to do now. So she goes to her supervisor, who, <laughs> who then goes to his supervisor, and he's actually, you know, um, drummed out of the, the service, and he goes back to become a reverend, right reverend, <laughs> in the Protestant Episcopal Church in New York. But it's kind of a Monica Lewinsky thing, because like I said, she kept the letters for years until she finally turned them over. And yes, these letters, along with the letter with the picture that he drew, because I've seen them. <laughs> he was a really great artist. <laughs> it happened. People are people. Last question. That's going to be a tough one to follow. <laughs> After World War II, all these British war brides came back with the troops. Mm -hmm. I, I know one situation itself, Antonio Ford, who was arrested as a Confederate spy and ended up marrying her jailer. But weren't there much in the way of what we would call war brides being brought back from the South by the troops that had come in that had occupied the South? No. Doesn't appear to be. Because here's the thing, I mean, uh, communities that already knew each other before the war, I mean, it, it, no, I, I don't see any indication of that, that there's this influx of women from the South going to the North. I mean, think about it. I mean, for good Lord, for at least five years, there's a national movement to build a nation built on hating Yankees. Yeah. Yeah, so. If you really want to upset your family, I mean, good Lord, think about what happened to poor uh, uh, Davis's child, right? She wants to, you know, that's just not going to happen. Right. So. The only possibility is the woman looking and saying, hey, half the eligible guys aren't coming back. Yeah, there, that, that's one. Yeah. And then there's, you know, other things that happen. Multiple families and, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Those things we don't talk about, right? We don't talk about polygamy existing, but it does. May not be legally married to anybody, but the family down the road a piece. Y'all got a few of those down here too, don't you? I know we do in Williamsburg, where I'm from. Uh, but anyway. 
<laughs> to behave myself. Anyway, I thank you all so much for coming out. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you at the next event. <laughs>